Welcome everyone to our first hometown chat event of 2022. Today's event is brought to you by Norfolk County's Heritage and Culture Department. And just for a friendly reminder, if you haven't already made a donation for today's presentation, then any donation you can make is greatly appreciated. I've shared the link below where you can make donations. I also wanted to plug some of our future programs and events coming up in the next few weeks. We have a junk journal workshop, which is a virtual event happening on January 26th. More details about this workshop can be found on all of our social media sites. And Norfolk County Heritage and Culture has also released a new children's program called Norfolk History Club for ages 6 to 10. Children will discover local Norfolk County history through a monthly subscription program that they will receive through the mail. So this is very exciting. I know as a child, I always loved receiving mail and I think uh, kids will, will really enjoy this program. So now to our event. Uh, today's guest speaker uh, for today's hometown chat is David Judd. And many of you uh, may know David Judd as the reporter who covers County Council for the Port Dover Maple Leaf. Uh, David Judd was born and raised in Simcoe graduated from the Simcoe Composite School and earned an honors BA in history from the Wilfrid Laurier University. He has been a journalist for 40 years, first as a reporter with the weekly Nanticoke Times, Nanticoke Times in Waterford, and then as a reporter, editor, and managing editor at the uh, Brantford Expositor. For the last 10 years, he has covered Norfolk County Council for the Port Dover Maple Leaf. In the 1970s, he's helped write histories of Waterford and Townsend and the town of Simcoe. And in retirement, he's edited a photo history of Port Dover. Uh, David is also a member of the Norfolk Remembers Committee. Um, and he's been instrumental in the Norfolk Remembers uh, Second World War publication. David's covered Townsend's groundbreaking in 1979 and the first years of its development. And he's written and presented about Townsend several times over the past few years. So we're very excited uh, to have David here to speak about Townsend. Um, so we're very pleased to welcome David and uh, we're excited to learn more about this topic. And I'll pass it over uh, to David now. What if they gave a city and nobody came? That's kind of an exaggeration, but it's basically the story of Townsend, the city that never was. Townsend was going to be a super community in Haldup and Norfolk, the next Mississauga. The Ontario government spent millions of dollars planning it and starting to build it. But the people didn't buy into Townsend and it never became anywhere near the project that it was supposed to be. Instead of 250,000 people, it, only got about a thousand people. Now today's presentation is not to bash Townsend, it's to rediscover Townsend and tell its story, to tell why it was built, how it was built, why it failed to succeed, and a little bit of what it's like today. So let's get going. Obviously this map is not to scale, but it gives you a good idea of where Townsend is. So if we start down Lake Erie, Here's the Natty Coke industrial area. Here's Port Dover, Highway 6 going up this way and Highway 3 east and west over to Simcoe. So Townsend is just northwest of Jarvis. It's about a 20 minute drive from Townsend down to the industrial area. And the idea basically was that this would be the place where people would live and then work at Natty Coke. In the 1970s in Ontario, a main principle was orderly growth. Ontario had had a problem with Mississauga. Mississauga did not grow in an orderly way. It was just a collection of uh, existing towns and big subdivisions that came together in kind of a patchwork. And in 1968, Ontario created Mississauga. And they said, we don't want to do this again. Whenever we have a, a big area, developing, we want this thing planned, and that was going to be Townsend. So in 1974, there was a dream of building a city of 250,000 people on 14,000 acres. Townsend was to be the region's preeminent urban center for housing, business, shopping, and local government. By 1979, they refined it a bit, and the goal was now 100,000 residents, 
40,000 of those residents would be there by the year 2000. The very first phase, Townsend was to have 5,000 people in 1,600 homes by 1985. There'd be 500 acres of in industry and the whole thing would pay for itself through increased assessment. Here's a population graph showing what the government was thinking. So you can see my cursor. About 1980, Haldeman and Norfolk together had about 90,000 population. But Nanny Coke was supposed to bring 100,000 people into the two counties. So you see this line here going up. By the year 2001, they were supposed to have 200,000 people in Haldeman, Norfolk. In other words, double the size, an extra 100,000 people. Now, if you put 100,000 people all in one place, that'd be a city the size of Brantford. So obviously the existing towns in Haldeman and Norfolk, such as Simcoe and Port Dover and Jarvis, Hagersville, couldn't absorb 100,000 people. You needed something much bigger and something much better planned. And that was going to be Townsend. Here's the plan for 100,000 population. This is six miles from the top here at Villanova. That's in the north and go all the way down to the south here at Highway 3. The pink area is agriculture. The yellow is residential. The red areas are government and business. And the blue squares are schools. And the purple area is industry. So that's what they had uh, in mind for the first 100,000. In real estate, they always say the main principles are location, location, location. And Townsend was almost exactly in the center of Haldeman and Norfolk. In fact, it was on the border between Norfolk and Haldeman. Two thirds of it was in former Norfolk County and one third was in Haldeman. It was at the main intersection or close by to highways three and six and three railways. There's a 20 minute drive to Nanticoke Industries. There's near a utility cor corridor. It's flat, billable land. There are no gas wells there. And it's not a prime agricultural area. It's at the headwaters of three creeks. So there's no flooding or sedimentation problems. It's easy to create lakes in the clay soil. The land was much cheaper than if they had to buy land in Simcoe or build a town in the Lynn Valley, which they also looked at. There'd be no urban sprawl because existing towns would be able to continue continue to grow. And Townsend would be a distribution point for water to Jarvis, Hagersville and beyond. So facilities for 100,000, all this was planned out. They had spots picked out for all of these things. So there's going to be nine schools and a community college, municipal offices, pl police station, fire hall, hospital, library, department store, hotel, cinema, art gallery, a bus depot, a train station indoor sports center. And here's what was built. This, this is a Google map showing what was built on 400 acres out of the 14,000 acres. So there's two main roads. The one going north south was originally called Townsend Parkway. It's now called Keith Richardson Parkway. The one going east and west was originally called Nanticoke Creek Parkway. It's now called Gordon Miller Trail. The village center is here, has uh, two office buildings. The village pond, this is an artificial pond that they built. And there are three subdivisions. There's Eden Ridge, Forest Park, and Willow Glen. Now down here, there's a uh, seniors complex. And over here is the Children's Aid Society office. So population today, about 1,200 including the, the seniors residents, that's only 1.2% of the 100,000 people they're looking at. 400 acres, less than 3% of the 14,000 acres. There are no shops, no schools, and no services at Townsend. In fact, you can't even buy a coffee there. The industrial area was never developed. Now, Townsend cost about $60 million 25 years ago, which is worth about $110 million in today's money. And South Cayuga, which was a sister city, which was never built, cost $35 million by 1989. And for a total of $95 million for Cayuga, South Cayuga, worth today close to $175 million. 
Now here's my personal interest. 1970s, there was a newspaper in Waterford, the Weekly Nautical Times. And in 1979, I got my first job there as a junior reporter. The motto of the Times was covering the city of Nanticoke like a tent. And its logo was these big skyscrapers you see up in the north end, north end, the top, top left of the uh, masthead there. Well, of course, the skyscrapers were never built. Now, there was a week of big stories in the Nanticoke Times for the uh, week of August the 2nd to the 9th, 1979. So one big story was blue mold was running rampant in, in the uh, tobacco fields. Uh, tobacco still was king in Norfolk County in those days. So this was a very big deal. But an even bigger deal was the tornado that ripped through Vanessa and Waterford. I covered the tornado and I wrote this story and I took two out of the three pictures. And toward the back of the Nanticoke Times that week was a story about that groundbreaking for Townsend. Now, I remember sitting in the Nanticoke Times office and getting a press release saying, Housing Minister Claude Bennett will be in Townsend on a certain day, breaking ground for a new city. And I thought, this has to be a joke. Who would build a city in the middle of nowhere? And I almost didn't go. But then I thought I'd better go. And in fact, there was a groundbreaking. Uh, Mr. Bennett was there, he had a gold shovel, and with him was uh, Alderman Norfolk MPP Gordon Miller, Bob Nixon from Brant Haldeman MPP, and Keith Richardson, the regional chairman. Now this was out on the side of the road, they just dug a little bit of dirt for the cameras, and then uh, all the officials took off for a perch dinner in Port Dover. I don't think the reporters were invited. So oh, just because I wasn't aware that there was going to be a city of Townsend doesn't mean that other people didn't know. In fact, there had been a lot of planning going into it. In fact, it started in centennial year. That's the year Hydro revealed its plan to build an $800 million coal-fired generating station at Nanticoke. The following year, Stelco announced plans for an $800 million Nanticoke mill. Uh, Lake Erie Works was approved in, on 6,000 acres in 1973, and the first steel was produced in 1980. In 1969, Texaco announced it was going to build an oil refinery at Nanticoke. Originally, Texaco wanted to build this refinery in Burlington, but there's a lot of opposition in Burlington, so the Ontario government led it to Nanticoke. So you had three big industries all coming in the early 1980s. A little bit more on Texaco here. Production started uh, in 1978 and it was sold to Imperial Oil in 1989. And coming soon, an auto plant. This was the big prize that uh, Medical Industrial Area was looking for. A car plant that would employ thousands of workers. And auto plants did come to uh, Ontario in the next few years. Toyota went to Cambridge and Woodstock. Honda went to Alliston. And GM Suzuki went to Ingersoll. But all of those plants are on or very near 400 series highways. Nanticoke Industrial Area is not on a 400 series highway. It's on two-lane Highway 6. And it did not get that plant, even though they were talking about it even into the 1990s. Now, there's a lot of planning went into Townsend. $3 million spent on studies. I told there are 14 meters of documents in the Ontario archives. On August the 7th, 1973, Treasurer John White came to the Erie Beach Hotel and rounded up all the local politicians and told them it was time to get started on regional government. They needed to get going because these industries were coming and there'd be massive expansion and they needed to have orderly growth. He said there's no time like the present to get started. And he wanted to start on January the 1st, 1974. But Local people were not ready to start that quickly, and the date was pushed back to April 1st, 1974. 
I always thought it was appropriate that regional government started on April Fool's Day. Here's a map of Haldeman and Norfolk region, which lasted from 1974 to 2000 when it was uh, realigned as Haldeman and Norfolk counties. I always thought the region should have been called Norfolk Haldeman because when you put it on a map like this, you see where it says Haldeman, there's Norfolk underneath it. And where it says Norfolk, it's Haldeman underneath it. So it's, it's kind of backwards. Now, the local residents really didn't have any say in this regional government coming. We were asked one question on the ballot, and that was, what name would you like for the new region? And the choices were Erie Region or Haldeman Norfolk. And people overwhelmingly chose Haldeman Norfolk. One month after the regional government started, John White announced that the province had bought 14,000 acres for $22 million for this new city of Townsend. I think Townsend got its name from the former township of Townsend. And later in the year, John White announced another city. This one at South Cuga, another $22 million. So why did we have the second city? Well, John White represented London, Ontario. And at that time, London was about 250,000 population. And John White thought that was the perfect size because it was just big enough. It had everything you could want. It had industry, university, uh, top-notch hospitals, uh, but it was easy to get around. There was still no big traffic jams, not like Toronto. So he thought that's the perfect size, 250,000. And if uh, Haldeman Norfolk gets a half a million people eventually, wouldn't it be good to have two cities? So they went ahead and bought an extra extra land for another city. Now let's going to talk about the building of Townsend. Developers often talk about a greenfield site and Townsend truly was a greenfield. As you can see, it really was just fields uh, and a couple of roads, there's nothing there at all. And here's the plan for 5,000 population. This is, Yellow area is residential. The blue dots are schools. And the red area is uh, for the village center with uh, commercial and business. This was all to be done in five years. There are three subdivisions, Inglewood, which later became, became Eaton Ridge, Forest Park, Willow Glen, and then the town center down the uh, southwest. Now, this is a concept of what the Townsend Village Center was supposed to look like. With six office and commercial buildings clustered around the pond. Now this pond was not there originally, it had to be dug out. And it's only about three feet deep, you can walk across it. But the pond was kind of the center at the center of towns and, and part of the park system. Some more of what things were supposed to look like. They wanted a, a rustic look to these commercial buildings. Uh, lots of wood, uh, lots of brown, which was very popular in the 1970s. This is what the village center looked like from the parking lot. And it does more or less look like that today because those roughly the two buildings that were built. There was to be a plaza down on the edge of the water. And this would be a place for events, uh, maybe a farmer's market, concerts, that kind of thing. This is the east end of the uh, village pond. And it looks more or less like that today, except the sidewalk is just a narrow sidewalk. It's not big like this. Here's a view from the valley. It almost looks like a ski lodge or something. But all these things I mentioned earlier were planned. And so we have different facilities. We have a church. This, there was a church actually built, but it's the only one of all these that was built. Supermarket, uh, high school up here, library, a pool, service station, 
Uh, sports fields. There are some sports fields. Sports fields of towns. And of course, there'd be an indoor indoor mall. The Ontario Land Corporation built a model and put it under plexiglass, and they trotted it around to different places so the public could see what towns it would look like. And here it is at a meeting of the City of Nanticoke Council in February 1979. I remember seeing this model at the Norfolk County Fair, probably in 1979. A year later, they're building Townsend. The push was on to get the first houses built by the end of 1980 and have people live there. So this is November, 1980, a little more than a year after they broke ground. And look at what they've got done. They've got uh, Townsend Parkway here, Nanticoke Creek Parkway. They've got the first uh, houses. They've dug out the pond. And they've built this pedestrian bridge here. Now this pedestrian bridge, this was not built because they needed a bridge for traffic. It was built so people could walk under the roads. This is one of the uh, safety features or selling points of Townsend because it was supposed to be for young families. And they boasted that you could walk from anywhere in Townsend to anywhere else without crossing a major road because you could walk under the main roads through these tunnels. And I should mention that a lot of these pictures that you're going to see I took on Friday afternoons because Friday afternoons in the news business are usually pretty slow. So often what I do is I drive out to towns and see what was going on, take some pictures. So here they are laying pipe. And here are the footings for the village center. Lots of activity here. By February, 1981, the village center is taking shape. And I love these, this picture from April, 1981, lots going on. The village center is going up there, getting the roof ready. You can see equipment, houses, uh, built and under construction. And in the background, you can see the water tower being built. Now here's the village center as it was on the 10th anniversary of Townsend in 1989 with all the landscaping in place, the pond all filled up and looking nice. Those steps where they could have events. Let's look at some builders' plans. This is August 1980, and we've got to sell a lot of houses and get people in place by the end of the year. Now, this is for young families, so it's got a boy and his dog. There's quite a variety of housing uh, that you could buy at Townsend. But I want you to have a look at this one here, the Cedar Ridge from 39900 Affordable housing in 1979 or 1980 was under $40,000. So Townsend wanted to say it had affordable housing, and there was. There's four units of it, these four townhouses, starting at $39,900. And I wanted to buy one of them because it was a tremendous deal. I really hadn't thought too much about what it would be like to live in Townsend. I just thought this was just too good a deal to pass up. Because for $39,900, you got, got a house. And the ones on the end, which I want, want one of those, are only connected by the garage to the ones in the middle. So basically, it's in a separate building. And for that, you got a paved driveway, a garage, sodded yard, uh, house with carpeting, and all appliances. A complete house ready to move in for $39,900. And they had an open house on a Saturday. And I was going to go down and, and see if I could buy one of these houses on the end. But on the Saturday, I got a bad cold or the flu or something. And I couldn't go. And I waited till the following Saturday. And when I got there, the salesperson told me they just sold the last one. So I didn't get one of the uh, affordable housing units in Townsend. 11.5% mortgages. Now, that, this would be a shocking amount today. But in the early 1980s, interest rates went crazy. 
and mortgages went up as high as 20%. I remember buying Canada savings bonds at 19%. So 11 and a half more percent mortgage mortgages were a deal and were uh, subsidized by the Ontario government. There are plenty of different sizes available at towns. And some of them were relatively small, like the one on the right for $49,000, 1,029 square feet. Not that big. Uh, most of them had one car garages and smaller lots, not so big frontages. But the thing is that towns and there's parkland everywhere and all the houses were within a block of so of a, of a major park. So you really, didn't need such a, a large yard for each house. Here they're building a house. Now you individuals could not buy lots of Townsend. They were all sold to developers because the Ontario government didn't want people buying a lot and then not building on, just leaving it empty. They wanted houses up and people in them. And everything was controlled. All the designs had to be approved. And they had a bunch of rules, such as there'd be no pink garage doors in towns. So everything had to look nice. And here's the residential district. We're getting into October. It's getting closer to that deadline. Big open house on November the 15th, 1980. A lot of people came out and looked at the houses that day. You see they even have street lamps. Looks like curbs and gutters even. And here are the first residents, the Warren family, who moved in at the beginning of December. Now, Mr. Warren worked at Stolco, and he looked all around in Simcoe, Port Dover, and he decided that Townsend was the best deal for his money. And the Ontario Land Corporation celebrated the first residents, gave them a key to the city and this Christmas tree. There was a pioneer spirit among the uh, early settlers, shall we say, at Townsend, because there were no activities organized. They, get, they made a community association so they could have events and uh, arrange some sports for the kids, that kind of thing. And by February 1984, there's a Lions Club formed, which did a lot of projects for the community. This picture of the water tower kind of fascinated me because it looks as if they built the, the tank part where you put the water down low and then raised it up to the top of the tower. Townsend even had its own private lake, its own conservation area. It was called Quarry Lake, and that's because it was an old quarry where they took the gravel out and helped build Townsend. And they sculpted some islands so fish would have a place to shelter. They spent $165,000, trucked in sand from Simcoe, and voila, you have your own conservation area. For the first few years, it was free to use for towns and residents. It had lifeguard, picnic tables, and it was right next door to towns. And you can just see some buildings over the top of the ridge there. After a while, they uh, put up a uh, um, hut at the, at the entrance and charged admission to get in. There also was a big push by the Ontario government to have local government set up at Townsend. They wanted the regional government to build new offices there. And that would bring business to Townsend and activity and people would see Townsend as they came here. And it'd be a lot more efficient because Alderman Norfolk had offices in Simcoe and Cayuga. The staff were constantly driving back and forth. It wasn't a very efficient system. So here's the architect Ron March with the drawing of the regional building. Building the uh, regional building. Regional chairman Keith Richardson laying the cornerstone. I remember it was a wet, rotten day, but he was out there posing for us. Here's the building uh, almost ready at the beginning of 1983. And regional chairman and the regional clerk, Mary Lou Johnson, were packing in June. So it must have been in the summer of 1983 that they got the regional building up and going. Here's what it looked like 
1989 with all the landscaping. This was a beautiful building. And it was a heck of a deal for Holdem and Norfolk because uh, the land corporation built it, 38,000 square feet, donated nine acres of land and charged the region $165,000 a year with no increase in fees for 25 years to the year 2008. And Ontario Land Corporation and the governments were constantly promoting talents. Uh, they had all kinds of events and open houses, that kind of thing. And the motto was, come on home to Townsend. One of the things they did was to have a winter fest with the local mayors uh, taking part in some hokey events, uh, pushing each other around on, on these sleighs and that kind of thing. And there was a Townsend mascot for a while. It was a rabbit. It was a guy in a bunny suit. And they also had a lot of uh, advertising, especially in print media and on the radio. And toward the end of the advertising, they went with a country and Western theme, I guess, to go with your home in the country. And they had a bluegrass group that sang a, a jingle for Townsend. I can't, I'd love to hear it again because it went something like, Come on home to Townsend. Yeehaw! Another drawing card was the Townsend Trail. This was a trail that they built 13 and a half kilometers along Nanticoke Creek, stretching from Townsend up to Rockford. And this was to be a place for hiking cross-country skiing and so on for the young families would be in towns and be looking for things to do. And also, of course, to bring people to the trail and maybe you'll stop and look at some houses while you're there. Here's what the trail looks like today. I took this picture in early December. For the first few years, it was well groomed and maintained, but obviously it hasn't been for quite a while, although it looks like people have been walking through there. I didn't get very far because I became quite mucky along the side of the Nanticoke Creek and I didn't have my hiking boots on. Here's a summer festival, 1986. The crowds, these uh, events were kind of shrinking after a while. So it doesn't look like there's all that many people for this one. Here's 1984 and Nanticoke Mayor Harry Scott I think he slipped and uh, went under briefly and was uh, kind of sputtering. And Nanny Coke uh, staff member Ron Sinden came to his aid here. I think this was the biggest day in Townsend's history. It was Labor Day weekend, 1981. And the Land Corporation brought in the Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra with Boris Brat. And they, Orchestra set up on the steps in the plaza by the uh, village pond, and they brought Boris over in this boat while the orchestra played water music. There's a huge crowd there, estimated at 1,200 people. And then after the concert, they had to go have a look at the houses. Well, they didn't have to, but a lot of them wanted to. Now for a bit of a diversion. This is Townie the Towns of Monster, which I created in May 1982. It all started uh, when I was watching a TV show about the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland and how people came from all over the world to see the monster, even though they didn't actually see it. And I thought, this is a pretty good gimmick, get people to come visit. Maybe the Ontario Land Corporation could do something like that and put a monster in its pond. So I created one for them. I went to the library and got a children's book of dinosaurs and photocopied a brontosaurus. Then I took a picture of the uh, village pond, cut a slot in it with a pair of scissors and stuck the brontosaurus in it and then rephotographed it. This is obviously in the days before uh, Photoshop, but I wanted it to look hokey so that uh, people would see that it's some, something weird going on here and read my column, which uh, says something like, 
This is the latest attraction from the Ontario Land Corporation. They've got this monster that appears every weekend, Saturdays and Sundays at two o'clock, like clockwork. Um, scientists can't figure out where the monster comes from because the pond's only three feet deep. Uh, stuff like that, uh, allegedly a humor column. It turned out the joke was on me because a couple of months later, I was sitting in my office and I got a phone call. The voice said, Mr. Judd? And I said, yes. He said, you wrote about the Townsend Monster? And I said, yes. He said, well, I've got a busload of people from Buffalo with me and we've come to see the monster. We're in Jarvis right now and we need directions. And I said, well, you realize it's a joke. And there's a long pause and it's a joke. And I said, yeah, it is. It's a humor column. And he said, oh, okay, thank you. So what happened here was that the Iroquois people um, believed that once upon a time, there were monsters on the earth, something like dinosaurs, but these monsters didn't go extinct. They went underground and continued to live in tunnels and caves under the earth. And one day when the earth is coming to an end, they will reappear. So I think what happened was someone on Six Nations clipped out my column and sent it to someone in Buffalo. And they, of course, didn't realize what the joke was about. And uh, that's how they got up this busload of people. The end of the dream. By 1989, there are no building lots left in Townsend. The government was not extending the, the water lines and the roads, et cetera. The last 48 lots were built on in 1990. So what went wrong? Well, as I said before, Nanny Coke didn't grow industrially because basically it wasn't on a 400 series highway. The workers that did come to Nanny Coke commuted from Hamilton or they settled in Simcoe, Port Dover, St. Jarvis. They had that problem with the interest rates. Uh, Townsend's not for everyone because you have to drive to everything. It was too quiet for some folks. I heard of people who moved out from Hamilton and then found they were always driving back to Hamilton to do anything. So they went back to Hamilton. Uh, some of the properties were too small for some of the country folks. In any event, 1985, the David Peterson liberals were elected and they pulled the plug on Townsend. So the dream died. Even in 1980, they were saying that land would stay in agriculture for a long time. By 1982, they had to give incentives to sell houses. By 1986, the land corporation was selling land back to farmers. By 1990, the last houses were built. 1999, the province closed its Townsend office after 20 years. Uh, Townsend uh, became part of Haldeman County and Haldeman sold the regional building to the Children's Aid Society for $715,000. And Haldeman sold the village center to a private developer for $475,000. Some updates to what happened at Nanico. Hydro station was decommissioned in 2013. Stacks toppled 2018. The whole plant was torn down 2019. Today, there's a large solar farm there, but it only produces 1% of the, of the electricity that the coal fire plant did. Stelco uh, was bought by US Steel in 2007 and went through a few rocky years. In 2017, Bedrock Industries bought it. And today, uh, Steel Mill is, is still operating with 1,250 employees. The oil refinery is still going. Uh, it was bought by Imperial Oil in 1989. It has 300 employees and 53 oil tanks. Land banks. In 2006, the Ontario government said that land at towns in South Cuba was on the table to settle six, names, six nations land claims, but nothing came of that. Today, Ontario still owns 1,400 acres at Townsend and 4,900 acres at South Cuyahoga. I know that because I filed a Freedom of Information request just a while back, and that was the answer that I got. So 
10% of the land that Ontario bought for towns, it still owns, and it still owns 40% of the land that it bought for South Cayuga. So Townsend today, if you come in from Highway 3 at the south end, you'll see Keith Richardson Parkway, which was originally Townsend Parkway. You go up the road and on the right hand side, you'll see the Parkwood Meadow Seniors resident, residence, which opened in 1986. This facility constantly seems to be expanding. And I think it's kind of ironic because it's the most successful facility in Townsend. I mean, Townsend was built for young families. And the thing that's really prospering here is the seniors residence. Across the street is the former regional, regional building, now the Children's Aid Society office. The Townsend Community Church was built at the main intersection in 1988. Anko Creek Parkway is Gordon Miller Trail. And here's the main intersection. There's a welcome to Townsend sign. In behind in this picture is the uh, village pond with uh, ice and snow on it. Mature neighborhoods, they look really nice. I think it's a nice place to live. The two uh, built office buildings that were built look slightly different. They have new siding and roofs on them. The trails along Nanico Creek are private property now. Keep off the grass. The Quarry, Quarry Lake is a private residence with a gate. But something is happening now. The first new housing in 30 years is being built. This picture I took in November, 2021. Calibrex uh, is building 30 townhouses around the village center. There was a previous plan called the Riverwood Golf and Country Club that never really got off the ground, although they did put in some pipes, but uh, they didn't actually build any uh, townhouses or the golf course. Now we're going to watch the price of townhouses go up at Townsend. This is this Riverwood project. As I say, it didn't really get going. In uh, spring 2014, $239,000 if you wanted to pre-order one. By the fall, the price had gone up to $289,000. Then two years later, it was up to $339,000. And today, $579,990 or the Calibrex townhouses. Some final thoughts. Townsend was a bold, well-designed project. It was based on flawed assumptions about growth. In the short run, Townsend was not needed. And South Cuba certainly was not needed. In fact, I'd say South Cuba is a total white elephant. In the long run, Townsend has been a good place to live for two generations of residents. And it contributed to a regional vision that led to a big water intake being built in Nanticoke on the shores of Lake Erie. This water intake was designed to be huge because it was to serve the industry at Nanticoke and the huge city of Townsend. And when they were building Townsend, they were able to hook up Jarvis and Hagersville and the later New Credit. And that regional vision is going to probably will pay off soon because they're talking about extending that water system to Simcoe, Waterford, Port Dover, and Six Nations. So I'm thinking maybe in five, 10 years when the people in Simcoe turn their taps on and get water from Lake Erie from Nanticoke, maybe they'll stop for a second and thank Townsend for helping make that possible. And that's my presentation. Well, thank you so much, David. Uh, that was an uh, excellent presentation and loaded with uh, tons of well-researched uh, information and, and graphics, and, and it was really, really enjoyable. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for everyone for joining us uh, for, our, again, our first event of 2022 of uh, Hometown Chat. And um, 
On behalf of everyone from Norfolk County Heritage and Culture, again, thank you uh, to David Judd uh, for the wonderful presentation and thank you for everyone who, who joined us today. Have a, have a great evening. <laughs>